All right, so in this video lecture, we're going to cover um, the first half of lesson 15 on international trade. So in previous lessons, you know, we've been kind of taking things from a domestic perspective, not really considering, uh, you know, much about trade in much detail. Of course, we've talked about net exports and how it's a factor of, you know, demand and expenditures. But now we're going to look at uh, this, this international trade in more detail. And so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to develop a very simple model and it's going to help us uh, to understand and explain a couple of key concepts when it comes to international trade. Um, on the study guide, uh, those, those first three questions, what are absolute advantage, comparative advantage in terms of trade, uh, this model is going to illustrate those concepts. So to do this, uh, to set up the model, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to keep it simple. So we're going to make a few simplifying assumptions. So first off, we're just going to look at two countries. All right. Now, there are a lot of countries in the world, but to keep it simple, we're just going to look at two of them. And so in our example, we'll look at the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, the second simplification or simplifying assumption we're going to make is that we're just going to consider that these two countries are only making two goods. Now, of course, the United States and the U.K., you know, our countries, we make lots of goods and services, but we're just going to boil it down to just two. So in our example, we're going to look at fish and chips. So two countries, U.S. and U.K., producing two different uh, goods, fish and chips. Now, the, the third big assumption we're going to make um, has to do with the country's production possibility frontier. So remember, from um, an earlier, earlier lesson, we looked at, you know, uh, how a country is going to choose between, you know, capital goods and consumer goods and, you know, how they allocate their resources. And recall that that PPF was actually a curved line. And, uh, you know, we, we explained that curvature uh, by, uh, you know, thinking about the resources that you need to make either consumer or capital goods. Now, of course, some resources you can substitute back and forth pretty easily, but other resources are highly specialized, which means they're not going to be perfect substitutes for one another. So um, an engineer is not going to be a good substitute for old, Mc, uh, old McDonald, you know, on the farm and vice versa. Now, because this is a simple model, um, what we're going to assume is that the opportunity costs that these two countries face are constant. In other words, we're going to assume that all of the resources they need to make these two goods and services are going to be perfect substitutes. What that's going to do is it's going to take their PPFs and rather than being curved like they were before, it's going to make them straight. So that, that straight slope, that constant slope, suggests constant opportunity cost. And that's going to, that's going to be a big uh, sim uh, simplification that we make, but it's going to uh, make the model a lot easier to use. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a couple of PPFs. So I've got United States and UK and on the vertical axis I'm going to track their fish production and on the horizontal axis I'll track their chip production. Okay, so I got my labels there. And now what we want to do is think about well, you know, what could these two countries possibly produce on their own? So each country has its own um, endowment of resources. It has its own quantity of land, labor, and capital. Um, it's of a fixed quality. Um, they have different levels of technology. So each country is going to have a unique PPF. So let's say that in the United States, if they use all of the resources to produce nothing but fish, let's say they can produce, we'll keep it relatively simple, we'll say 50 fish. Okay? And alternatively, if they use all of the resources to produce nothing but chips, let's say they can produce 30 chips. And then, of course, they can produce you know, some combination of the two. And so if we were to map out all of those combinations between those two extremes, you know, all or nothing, we'd get a PPF like that. All right, so 50 fish or 30 chips or some combination. So all of the points along that PPF are possible combinations that the United States can produce. Now, the UK... Right? Different country, different resources, different quantities, quality resources, different technology. Uh, they're going to have their own PPF. So let's say that um, they can produce either, let's say, 25 chips, okay, if they do nothing but chips. And then let's say they can produce maybe 20 fish, if they produce nothing but fish. And then, of course, you know, some combination of the two. And so they're going to get a PPF that's, you know, a little bit smaller, okay? So these are our two countries, they're two PPFs, and we see what they are each capable of producing on their own. All right? So we've set up the model. Now what we can do is start to identify uh, some of these key terms that I mentioned in the study guide. So the first question we want to ask is, who has the absolute advantage 
in the production of fish and who has the absolute advantage in the production of chips. And to have an absolute advantage simply means that you can produce more of something than somebody else. So in our example here, if we look at it, well, we see that the United States can produce 50 fish, and the UK, on their own, they can produce 20 fish. So clearly, the United States has the absolute advantage in the production of fish. It can produce over twice as much fish as the UK. So the United States has the absolute advantage in fish, but what about chips? Well, again, we just look at the numbers, and we see, okay, these guys can produce 25 chips, but the United States, we can produce 30. So not quite as much of an advantage, but we still have the absolute advantage in chips. So in our example, the United States has the absolute advantage in the production of both fish and chips. It can simply produce more of both goods and services. Now the question is, well, if the United States can produce more of everything on its own, would it have any interest in trading with the UK? Would it have any interest in exporting or importing fish or chips? An absolute advantage, in this case, it doesn't look like there'd really be you know, much in it for the United States because they can produce more of everything. But that's where we need to go to our second concept. Uh, we need to identify not just absolute advantage, uh, but comparative advantage. And what we're going to be trying to figure out here is, well, who can, who's better at producing something? Not necessarily who can produce the most, but who can do it better. Uh, more technically speaking, we'd say that to have the comparative advantage in the production of a good means that you can produce it at the lowest cost in general, like if you're talking about you know, the number of dollars or British pounds it takes to produce one or the other. Uh, but more generally, and this is what's going to matter for our models, uh, not just the lowest cost, but the lowest opportunity cost. All right, so remember what a PPF tells us is you know, all of the, the possible combinations that these two countries can produce. And we know that if you want to produce more of one, you're going to have to give up some of the other. And so what we're going to do in our simple model is actually calculate the opportunity costs in the United States, and we're going to do the exact same thing for the UK. And once we've calculated those opportunity costs, then we'll be able to determine who has the comparative advantage. So what we're going to do, to keep it simple, is we're going to just work with uh, these two numbers for the US and then we're going to work with those two numbers for the UK and we're just going to take some ratios so what if the United States were producing you know nothing but fish they were producing 50 fish well if they were to sacrifice all 50 fish and reallocate the resources what could they do instead well they could produce those 30 chips and alternatively if they you know gave up the opportunity to produce all 30 chips reallocated their resources they could produce those 50 fish instead all right, so we've got a trade-off working both ways. And so what we want to do is figure out how many fish would they have to give up to produce one more chip. Not all 30 chips, just one chip. And then likewise, how many chips would they have to give up to produce one more fish. So we're going to take these numbers. We're going to plug them into some ratios. So for the United States, we're going to say, well, I could give up, or they could give up 50 fish, and in exchange, they'd be able to produce 30 chips. So we're going to write it like that. All right, so 50 fish, the number on top, that's what we're giving up, and what are we going to get in exchange? We're going to be able to produce those 30 chips. Now what we want to know again is how much does it cost to produce one chip in terms of fish. So all we need to do is just take that 50 and divide it by 30, all right, so you plug that into your calculator, and that's going to simplify out to about 1.6 repeating. So we can we can just round up and say 1.7 fish for every one chip. Okay? So we just type that in um, and you'll get of course a repeating decimal. We're just going to round it to, to one decimal. Alright? So if they give up all 50 fish they produce 30 chips but for each individual chip they would only have to sacrifice um, or give up the opportunity to make 1.7 fish. Alright? So that's the opportunity cost of a chip in terms of fish in the United States. Now you do the same thing for uh, the fish. If the United States gave up all of its chips and produced nothing but fish instead, what would that look like? Well, we're just going to take the reciprocal. So it's going to be the 30 chips that we're giving up, and that would allow us to then produce 50 fish. So we give up the chips, right? And we use the resources instead to make the fish. And again, we want to simplify this. Because again, we want to know, well, what's the cost um, of producing one fish? So if we plug that into our calculator, just take 30 divided by 50, that will simplify to 0 
So we'll have to give up 0 0.6 chips for every one fish that we want to produce. All right, so these are our opportunity costs that we face in the United States based on our production possibilities. Okay, Every time the United States wants to produce one more chip, they would have to forego the opportunity to produce 1.7 fish. And if instead they want to produce one fish, they would have to give up the opportunity to produce those 0 0.6 chips. Okay, Now, we need to do the exact same thing for our cousins across the sea. So they've got their unique uh, production possibility combinations, and so we're going to do the exact same thing for them that we did for the United States. We're going to just going to take the ratios and simplify to figure out the cost of one chip and one fish in the UK. So we could give up all 20 fish, and that would allow us to produce 25 chips. And then if we simplify that, 20 divided by 25, that's going to simplify to 0 0.8 fish for every one chip in the UK. And then we take the reciprocal, we gave up all 25 chips and produced the 20 fish instead. We take 25 divided by 20 and that will give us what? So 5 over 4, so 1.25 chips for every one fish. Okay? So there's our calculations for the UK showing the cost of a chip in the UK in terms of fish and the cost of a fish in terms of chips. Okay. Now, remember, comparative advantage, what we're trying to figure out is who can produce something at the lowest opportunity cost. All right? So if we look at our numbers here, let's look at chips first. All right? So in the United States, to uh, produce that one chip, they would have to sacrifice or give up 1.7 fish. All right? So that's the opportunity cost of a, of a chip. In the United States. Over here in the UK, to produce the exact same chip, they would only have to give up 0 0.8 fish. Okay, So they clearly don't have to sacrifice as much fish to produce chips as the United States does. So what this tells us is that the UK has the comparative advantage in the production of chips. All right, So I'm going to note that. I'm just going to circle that so I know that the UK is going to produce those chips because the, of their lower cost. Now, what about fish? Well, again, we need to look at the, the opportunity cost. So in the United States, it costs them 0 0.6 chips to produce every fish. And over in the UK, it costs them that 1.25 chips for every one fish. So clearly, 0 0.6 is lower than 1.25. So that means the United States actually has the comparative advantage in producing each fish. Okay. So again, what we're doing is asking how much of one thing must you give up in order to produce more of the other. We take those ratios, we simplify them, right? so we know exactly how much one chip and one fish costs in each country. And then we look at those costs, so we look at the numbers on top and we compare them. So we compare 1.7 to 0.8 fish per chip. Right? We see 0.8 is lower, and so that means that if they have the lower cost, they'll specialize in uh, what's ever on the bottom. And then we do the same thing in the other, uh, with the other numbers, so 0 0.6 versus 1.25. Well, 0 0.6 is clearly lower, which means the United States will specialize in those fish. Okay? So, the United States has the comparative advantage in fish. The UK has the comparative advantage in chips. So now, it seems like there is a good reason for these two countries to engage and trade with one another. Right. Previously, with the absolute advantage, it seemed like there was no good reason because the U.S. could simply produce more of everything. But now that we see, even though that we can produce more chips than the U.K., it actually costs them less. They actually have the comparative advantage, whereas we have the comparative advantage in fish. So what we're going to do um, to engage in some trade is the first thing we need to do is reallocate our resources. Right. So we realize in the United States, well, we're not as good at making chips, so maybe we're going to choose a new combination of fish and chips where we're producing more fish. Right? Maybe we were trying to produce a lot of chips, but we realize, hey, we're not as good at it as the, as the, the guys in the UK. So we're going to reallocate to a different combination. Right? And what that's going to mean is that we're going to be giving up some chips, right? but we're going to be producing all of this extra fish. Well, what are we going to do with all that extra fish? We're going to send it over to the UK. What are they going to be doing? Well, remember, they've got the comparative advantage in producing chips. So they're going to shift their resources towards more chip production, 
it's going to give up. They're going to give up some fish, uh, but they're going to have all these extra chips, and so they'll take those extra chips and send them to the United States in exchange for all of that extra fish that we were producing. Okay, so we're going to specialize based on our comparative advantage. We'll produce more of what we're better at, and then we'll trade the extra. The question is, what would be acceptable terms of trade? In other words, if we're the U.S. and we're sending fish over to the U.K., how many chips are we going to get in exchange for every fish that we send them? Okay, so let's think about this. Let's focus on the fish. The United States is going to be producing all that fish, right? Well, what is, what is it costing us to produce the fish? Well, every fish we produce, we have to give up 0 0.6 chips. Okay, so that's what it cost us. So if we're going to send a fish over the UK in exchange for chips, well, at the very least, we're going to want to get back something more than what it cost us, right? If the UK says, hey, we'll give you a half a chip per fish, we'll say no dice. It cost us more than that to make it, okay? So the United States is going to be exporting those fish. It's selling fish, and it's going to want to try to get something more than that 0 0.6 chips. Now, England, UK, on the other hand, if they wanted to produce that fish themselves, what would it cost them? Well, they would have to sacrifice 1.25 chips. So if they're going to be purchasing fish from the U.S., right, if they're going to be importing American fish, how much are they willing to pay for every fish? Well, certainly no more than what it would cost them to produce that fish on their own. So they're going to be willing to pay anything less than 1.25 chips for fish and the United States, who's specializing in fish, is going to be willing to accept anything that's more than that 0 0.6. So we need to find some number in between 0 0.6 chips per fish and 1.25 chips per fish. So in this case, an easy, uh, simple terms of trade might be just a, a, an easy one-to-one -one ratio, right? If the United States sells a fish and it receives one chip, well, that's an extra 0.4 chips that they just earned from that fish. And if the UK is going to be paying one chip per fish, well, they just save themselves a quarter of a chip. Okay? And so what we're going to start to see, as countries recognize this comparative advantage, begin to reallocate their resources and specialize, is that it's not actually changing anything about our production. Because remember, in our example here, um, the PPFs themselves did not change. All we did was we just reallocated, right? In each country, we shifted resources one way or the other produced more of what we're better at, and then we trade the extra in exchange for something that the other guy's better at. And so what we're going to see is that while production doesn't necessarily change, right, our, our PPF doesn't, you know, expand or contract, what we are able to do is consume more. Because remember, in this example, in the United States, we gave up 0 0.6 chips to produce that fish, and when we send that fish to the UK, they send us back one chip. So we get back more than what we gave up to produce our fish. And that means we're going to be able to consume more chips than if we were just trying to produce fish and chips on our own. And the same thing is going to be happening in the UK. When they're selling their chips to us, they're going to be getting back more in fish, more than what they gave up. So they're going to be able to consume more fish and chips. So in these two, in these two countries, by just reallocating resources, are going to, once they trade with each other, experience higher levels of consumption. So this means people in both countries are going to be able to consume more than they could have if they were not trading. And we're going to see this translate into a higher standard of living. You know, it may, you know, fish and chips, yeah, we, you know, we don't necessarily have to produce those. We can survive without them. But think about, you know, other basic necessities, you know, clothing and basic food and, and medical products. Uh, when countries that aren't quite as good at making those can trade with other countries that are, they will then be able to consume these goods and services that they, you know, were having difficulty producing on their own. So their standard of living will increase because the overall consumption is going up. The other big benefit to trade is that at a macro level, right, across, across uh, the world, what we're going to see is that resources are going to be allocated uh, to the production of goods and services where they're going to be, you know, we're going to get the most bang for our buck. So we're going to be using our resources more wisely, or in other words, more efficiently, right? Uh, so remember when we talked about efficiency, uh, there was productive efficiency, you know, who can produce something at the lowest cost, and then allocative efficiency, which asked, well, are we allocating our resources out to the right mix of goods and services? Well, in the presence of trade, what we see is, you know what, maybe it's not such a good idea for the U.S. to produce a bunch of chips when there's somebody else that can do it better. So we'll reallocate our resources 
to produce more fish because we're better at producing fish, and those resources uh, will be much more productive producing fish than they were producing chips. And then the opposite would happen in the UK. So with this simple model, uh, what, we, what we see is, based on a few concepts of you know, absolute and comparative advantage in terms of trade, that there are some huge benefits to trade um, when countries agree to trade with one another. Um, those being overall uh, higher consumption, higher standard of living, and of course more efficient production. Not necessarily more production, but just more efficient use of resources. Now, the last thing we'll note for now in this video is of course, you know, the reality, because this, this again is just a simple model of trade, and in reality things are much more complex. So the two big things that we want to keep in mind when we're thinking about, you know, trade as it actually happens is, first off, you know, one of the simple, uh, simplifying assumptions we made was that our PPFs are straight. And in reality, we know that PPFs are going to be curved. Why? Well, because resources are not perfectly substitutable for one another, and what that leads to is increasing opportunity costs. So in our example here, when we calculated these opportunity costs, right, um, they're constant. For every one fish the United States wants to produce, it would have to sacrifice the same number of chips. But in reality, we know that as the United States um, reallocates more and more resources to the production of fish, eventually those opportunity costs are going to start to increase. And so in our example, you know, where we had a comparative advantage in fish because it only cost us 0.6, in reality, we would see that number actually start to increase as we produce more fish. And eventually, you know, maybe our cost per fish reaches the same level as the UK. And at that point, neither of us has the comparative advantage, and so we wouldn't trade in fish. We'd have to find something else to specialize in. Another thing that may uh, make trade not worth it are transportation costs. So obviously, the United States and the UK are not right next door to each other. Even if we were, the United States is a big country. You know, It takes time to move stuff from one side of the country to the other, let alone across an ocean. And so what we're going to see is that once you factor in transportation costs, it may you know, wipe out any gains you may experience because you can produce something at a lower cost. It costs the United States, in our example, less to produce the fish, right? It only costs us 0.6 uh, chips to produce the fish, but you know, what if the, the boat captain or the, the, the airline charges you another you know, 0.2 or 0.3 chips for every fish that they're going to transport to the UK for you? Well, at some point, those costs are going to add up. And then at that point, it may just be cheaper for you know, the UK to produce fish on their own rather than you know, trying to import um, fish from the United States. So these are the two big practical considerations uh, we want to keep in mind. In reality, as we specialize, it's a good thing. It has benefits, but due to increasing opportunity costs, there's limits. And then, of course, because we don't have teleporters yet and we actually have to spend additional funds to move goods and services and resources, those transportation costs can um, ultimately uh, wipe out any gains from trade.